Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Let's go ahead to Hebrews chapter 1. At Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, where our, our text for what we're teaching on right now. Hallelujah. It says, Thou hast put on, um, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower. I'm sorry, I'm in Hebrews chapter 2. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. By the way, it, like I said, 34 years for Janie and I. You know, you, that girl, somebody's been praying for her. I think she could deal with me for 34 years. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore thy God, therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Everybody say glory to God. Now, so last week we were talking about, we got into talking about sin. We covered the four words for sin. Talked about that one of the words for sin, the, the one that's used most in the Bible, means to, um, to come up short, to do amiss. Um, that, that is, and, and everybody, everybody comes up short. For all the sin to come short of the glory of God. And the second word for sin um, means to make a mistake, all right? Now, this is not, it's, it's not uh, as strong as a predisposed or a deliberate sin. You know, you've made a mistake, okay? And a lot of times, and especially in some of our newer teachings on sin and, you know, and God's grace, we want to, they just want to use these words and just say, well, sin's just missing the mark. Sin's just coming up short. You know, and kind of downplay it, but really, you know, um, that's, that is reference really to the sinner. The sinner, it just sins. He comes up short. He's going to. Amen? Make mistakes. Even Christians make mistakes. And uh, when you kind of take certain definitions and apply it everywhere, then, then we can water it down. Oh, see, God just, you know, just made a mistake. Change your mind. You'll be all right. But there are two more words used in reference to sin. One is the word um, for transgressions, parabasis. Is used for, the, for transgressions. Now, you cannot transgress unless there's a law and you know about it. How many transgressed on the way to church this morning? Now, come on. Let's be honest. There you go. Thank you, Cap. I sped. There's a, line, there's a sign out there that says speed limit, 65. That's on the interstate. In town, it's 45 or 35. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Anybody, anybody enter into parabasis this morning? You transgress. You pushed beyond the limit of the law. That's what it means. You pushed beyond. You pushed it out beyond the limit. You transgressed the law. And so, did anybody transgress this morning? Just don't look that way. You don't know. Ain't that right? There you go. All right. Any, anybody transgress today? Yeah. All right. Debbie, Julie, Ben, Carrie, Benny. Yeah, Benny did. Cap, repent, you sinners. <laughs> Brother Bill, did you? Parabasis this morning. Now this, my friends, is not parabasis. <laughs> it is iniquity. The fourth word is iniquity, the Greek word that means iniquity, which means lawlessness. We don't even look at the speedometer, we just go. We look at the sign, go by the sign, it's not there. Okay, the Greek word anomia, used for the word iniquity, where it says he, he loved righteousness, but hated iniquity is lawlessness. We gave you this definition last week. We'll throw it back in here again. Uh, the word lawlessness can mean similar to parabasis, that is pushing the limits of the law when it's just referring to transgressing. But when it, it, it goes beyond further in certain contexts and means lawlessness, anomia, and it means uh, not just the violation of the law, but this being lawless, and it, it means... Um, that the violation of law is to break a law, but lawlessness means, lawlessness means to abolish the law. To act as if the law didn't exist. Those of you who did not look at your speedometer 
were in anomia. You were acting as if the law didn't exist. Gotcha, didn't I, this morning? Yeah, hooked you a line and sinker, just rolled you right on in. All right? Um, and as we said last week, this is uh, the mystery of iniquity, the spirit and the character of the mighty movement that in the latter times will bring the lawless one, the Antichrist, to, to, to a world dominion. There'll be no law. It'll be lawless. And he will come in as the savior of the world to bring order. Now, we, we've got some of the craziest, stupidest stuff. Now, Bill Clinton, now that just, he was the president then, so I'll just call his name, ordered that no military personnel were to carry their weapons on base. That's why they're not, they weren't allowed to carry their weapons on the base in the States. Not at the recruit. That's why those four Marines are dead. Had that guy walked in with a gun and those, those Marines were armed, there'd have been one dead Muslim. Because they're trained to pull that weapon and to fire that weapon. And he walked in and pulled that gun out. They were gone. Boom, boom. All around. They were, they were going, mine got him first. <laughs> they, were comparing, they would be comparing which projectile got him and knocked him down. It would never happen. There's a lawlessness going on. I mean, we, we have things happen in cities and, and, and riots and things and burning and just tearing things down. It, it, it's a lawlessness, a spirit of lawlessness that begins to take place. It's happening everywhere. I mean, we, we, go, we, um, we have our, our congressmen and our senators and our, our elected officials who are lawless. We had people in the Benghazi situation who knew exactly what was going on and let those people die lied about it, and then nothing has happened. It's a lawlessness. Did you know that your senator and your congressman can do insider trading and you can't? They are not subject to insider trading laws. Why do you think they go to Washington with one level of socioeconomic standard and come out multimillionaires? Because they pass laws, quote laws, that benefit them, and they can't be charged with insider trading. Now, if you knew, had the same information and did the same thing, you're back in being jail. So we're, we're living in a stage of lawlessness where those uh, who had the power to, you know, just like our Supreme Court, we just struck down the laws of marriage. They, didn't, they did not create a marriage where, where, where homosexuals, if, if there is no constraint on who, and what, who can be married, then there is no such thing as marriage. We no longer have marriage as far as our government is concerned. Oh, yes, we do. We have homosexual. No, no, because now the polygamist is going to get married. The bestialitist is going to get married. The pedophile is going to get used to give it time. People say, you're crazy. No, it's coming. It's all coming. There is lawlessness in the realm of marriage now. Nothing is recognized. There's just, Jesus didn't say anything about, it. oh, give me a stinking break, read your Bible. He said, man, shall, you know, he said that in the beginning, of the, God created male and female. Amen. If you study what Jesus said, man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. W-I-F-E. Female word. Man, masculine word. Wife, female word. Don't mean you're acting like female. You are female. Okay? Okay. So anyway, Cap had it. What did you say? I said, but it's socially destructed gender. A socially destructed what? Gender is now socially constructed. They're, they're trying to do away in states with the terms husband and wife because it offends those who aren't male and female. Whether they're two males or two females. Go to spouse one, spouse two. Eliminate the terms husband and wife from all record. This is, a, this is lawlessness. What is this? The Bible, you said that's way. the spirit of Antichrist is already in the earth when the Bible was written. Now, who, who's the spirit of Antichrist? He is the son of iniquity, the son of lawlessness. And so we have all this lawlessness going on. We have this iniquity taking place. We have all this stuff taking place. And, and, and society is degrading at, at a rate we can't even keep up with. And Christians are jumping on the bandwagon and celebrating it and all this kind of stupid stuff. And, you know, I'm going to tell you something. You cannot love what God hates and love God. You just can't do it. Jesus loved righteousness. He hated. The word hated in this context means to abhor. Not just disdain. Abhor. When you abhor something, it's not a good word. Okay? He abhorred iniquity. 
He abhorred lawlessness. What, what, now let's think about it. What would be lawless? Well, God had law. God's always had law. He's had a moral law, a moral code that was built in man from the beginning. Amen. Now, what, now, what happened? The, the law was given to prove that we were utterly sinful. In other words, it showed what sin was. But God's always had a moral code. Sin's always been sin. When Adam and Eve transgressed, they, they did not sin. They didn't, they didn't come short. They didn't just do a miss. They didn't make a mistake. Adam transgressed in the Garden of Eden. He violated what God told him. You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that thou doest that, you shall surely die. King James, or Greek, or Hebrew, actually, I'm sorry, Hebrew, is in dying you will die. What, died spiritually? Then you'll die physically. God gave him a law. God gave him a commandment. And he transgressed that. Okay? And so, uh, this, this thing is going on all over the place. And so, you know, the Bible says, as in the day of Noah, when they were marrying and giving him marriage, they were drinking and, you know, just, I mean, what, what? man was lawless. Then that word marrying in the Greek means both male and female. In other words, they were rather, uh, homosexual marriage. You know, they were just, they were just getting together and, and, and the men just giving their daughters away. Uh, that marriage, marrying and marrying, uh, see, giving and marriage, uh, marrying and giving in marriage, that's meaning that the father's just giving the daughters away. Okay? So it's not that they were, you know, this one was marrying that one, and this, they were all happy. That, no, it meant homosexual marriage. You know, they were just, it's just lawless in the realm of marriage, as is with the days of Noah, so shall it be in the day the Son of Man comes. Now, when man entered into that state and became so lawless and such iniquity in the days of Noah, what did God do? He, brought, he, he flooded the earth. Why? Now, that's, you know, people say, oh, that was harsh. That would be God for God to flood the whole world and kill the whole world. That was just evil. He gave them 120 years to repent. Noah took 120 years to build the ark and preach the whole time. And they mocked him. They made fun of him. And probably all right to the moment the door was shut and the rain started, then they all of a sudden, hey, he's right. Let's go. Too late. Now, the only people that got saved was Noah's um, wife and children. All the other relatives, all the other friends, all of them perished. They all here? Okay. He, they did not, they did not, no one else got saved. They, for 120 years, he preached. He preached righteousness. He preached repentance. He preached. God gave them a 120-year window to get right, and they still rebelled against it. Now, it'd be one thing if God woke up one day, Noah walked outside, and there's a big boat out there. He said, get your family on there and get the animals on there and get me to wipe out the whole bunch. But it didn't happen that way, did it? Now, they got a 120-year reprieve. You know, We've been giving, God's been getting, he, said, he told us ahead of time, it's going to be like the days of Noah. Now we're seeing all kinds of, uh, of things going on and, and things taking place. And the church is preaching, and listen, the church that's supposed to be preaching ain't preaching enough. And the church that is preaching should shut up. <laughs> we have people that are saying, you know, this, the, the whole state of America right now is a direct result of the seeker sensitive uh, concept that came in about 25 years ago. We stop preaching holiness. We stop preaching righteousness. We stop telling people, that, you know, that God expects you to live a certain way. And we start preaching, come to church, have fun. Come to church, you know, it's, it's the happy, clappy church. You know, I believe, in positive, I believe in positive things. I believe God wants to, you know, develop the believer and make them. But I'm telling you, he also says you've got to repent first. You've got to get it right first. We can't bring the world in and try to make them, make them give them the blessings of being a Christian before they, they repent and get right with God. And so we, we got this whole mindset in the church. And listen, that, that, and, and secret sensitive on steroids is the, the radical grace message. So it just don't matter what you do, you're under grace. Hallelujah. Glory to God, it's all good. You know, you can live in sin. You can do whatever you want to do. You can be married to your homosexual lover, and that's okay. You're still going to heaven. Not! Now, Jesus hated iniquity. Have we got that? Jesus did what? But he also loved, come on, he loved righteousness. Hallelujah.
the word righteousness in, in the legal sense in the Greek, uh, in, you know, uh, classical Greek. We're just talking about when it was used in literature, used in, in, in everyday Greek. Now remember, there were words that were used in the language that took on biblical meaning or bi biblical uh, shades of meaning when they were used in the Bible. Okay? So the word righteousness in classical Greek uh, dealt with um, uh, how, do we, how do we say this? Seen from a legal and political standpoint, um, and then secondly, it was also viewed from a religious, ethical, and moral uh, standpoint. The legal overtones of this word are inescapable. From them, the term uh, evades the language of ethics. It continues to carry forensic or legal baggage. At the outset, it denoted a life governed by law and order and a sense of duty. Like in Plato's Utopia, the fund foundational government principle uh, w was the was that was we was governed by you were governed by that righteousness you know um, the realms of ethics and religion incorporated in this language in this word um, and it's a notion of virtue plays an important role in this um, and, and so um, in in the philosophies of the Stoics and so forth it became to mean you're governed by the by the government and you had a, you had an ethical or moral standing New Testament. Now, I, I honestly, if we, if we went into all the different ways, but we want to get into kind of Paul, the way he uses it, okay? Um, the magnitude and complexity of the Pauline discernment of uh, Dike Sune is obvious. The debate over works righteousness versus law of faith will continue to rage. But some issues are conceded by almost everyone. Paul's writings share with the rest of the New Testament that recognize that the righteousness initiated by the Christ event has eliminated any popular ideologies that saw righteousness as attainable through man's effort. Righteousness is solely expressed because of God's sovereign act, his glorious and de decisive intervention for man in Christ. In other words, we did nothing to get ourselves into a place to earn a standing, an illegal standing, and a moral standing with God. You can't go out and obey the law and get there. It had to be an act of grace of God. Now, remember this. What did Ephesians say? By grace are you saved through faith. Now, let's stop there. By grace are you saved. That's where a lot of people stop. Ah, it's all grace. No, 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 no. Through faith. There is an act on the part of the recipient called faith that receives that work. Now remember, show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. The faith, the faith, the faith righteousness believer who's received the grace of God, by the grace of God, the righteousness of God, but it was through faith, their actions demonstrate they have received that work of God. Amen? Hallelujah. Christ accomplished what the law could not do. Amen? Remember, by faith you say through, I mean, by grace you say through faith that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't, you can't take credit. Well, you know, praise God, I went to church 475 Sundays in a row, didn't miss a one. I get to go to heaven. Nope. Come up to the healing line. Lord, I hadn't missed a Sunday in 12 years. So, you didn't miss talking about your neighbor on, on, on 412 straight Mondays either. Righteousness is expressed by our actions. Christ, uh, Christians thus confirm their relationship to God. Your actions demonstrate. Remember they were first called Christians at Antioch. Why? They acted so much like the one they talked about. They said, you're like him. Christian means Christ-like or little Christ. So when they saw the actions line up with what they said, they said, you're like that. So their actions are a demonstration of the receiving of the work, of that, of that grace. Okay? Uh, indeed, their very lives testify to that relationship. Remember what the Bible said? You are living epistles known and read of all men. Amen? Well, you know, living, the word epistle means letter. Is it, is it stuffy in here? Anybody but you, me? It's stuffy. Somebody, somebody unstuff us. I mean, turn the air conditioner up. All right? So, we're living epistles known and read of all men, okay? That means <clears throat> that your life should, if you're going to be a Christian, you know, if you're going to be called a Christian, hello? if you're going to be Christ-like, it's got to go. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you're Christ-like, that means your actions look like what Jesus would do. 
Now, I'm going to sorry you people who go around and tell everybody that I'm under grace. I can do whatever I can fornicate. I can commit adultery. I can do whatever I want to do. And it don't matter to God. I am sorry. If you are Christ-like, Jesus didn't do that. Amen. Amen. So just save that garbage for some, you know, for Dr. Phil on television with his, his, his bedside uh, uh, psychological goobity gob. I don't buy into it. If you are Christ-like, if you are a believer, if you're a Christian, if you're Christ-like, if you're a little Christ, then your actions are going to be actions that represent a representative of how Jesus would act. Now, the one action everybody wants to talk about is he loved everybody. Yeah, he loved everybody, but the Bible says in Hebrews 1.9, he loved righteousness, but he hated iniquity. He abhorred iniquity. Now, abhorred it. So don't, don't, don't come to me with some half-cocked, half-stirred pile of soup and try to sell it to me as, you know, like, the, remember, how many remember the Disney uh, classic, The Sword and the Stone? Not, not The Sword and the Stone, um, Stone Soup. You remember, remember that one? The guy showed up with a stone, and they were going to make a pot of soup. They said, we can make a pot. This, this makes the best pot of soup in the world. And what it is, they said, let's get some water. Now put the stone in there, and they start telling them, bring all these vegetables, bring all this, you know. And really it was, these guys were hungry. They, they learned them a gig. And so, and they, they, they cooked the soup, and it was delicious. All it was was all the stuff that people brought. They, they, they were tricked, and it was a stone. They, they took the stone back out and went next down and did the same thing. You know? Um, hallelujah. I guess it was a Disney class. I remember reading that as a kid. You know, stone soup. You know, hey, don't, don't let the world sell you a bill of goods. Jesus hates iniquity. He hates lawlessness. He hates that which God hates. God hates sin. Amen. Folks, the whole reason Jesus came is because God hates sin. Amen. And he hates what it does to man. And he sent Jesus so man would not be bound by that which he hates. He could be delivered from it. So Jesus came to deliver us from what God hates, and that is the bondage of sin. Now, John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish. For the Son of God came to earth not to condemn the world. Now, see, you got a lot of people around. See, God don't condemn anybody. God doesn't say that's wrong. No, 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 no. Think about this. What does the word condemn mean? Now, the Greek word for condemn and the Greek word for damn are the same thing. Jesus came not in the, to the world to damn the world but that who would ever believe on him would have everlasting life. He did not come to put his arms of love around the sinner and seal them in that state of sin saying, I take, I love you just like you are because that would be damning them to hell. He came not to damn them, but to deliver them. You understand? See, we've misread that. We've misread that, that he just kind of came along and said, I love you, and I don't care what you do. There is no condemnation. I wouldn't do anything to make you feel bad. Now, you, you need to go get Dr. Benjamin Spock's book that your mama gave you for parenting and burn it. It's the dumbest book ever written. It's antichrist. Don't spank your children. It makes it, the Bible says the rod of correction drives rebellion from the heart of the child. I'll take the word of God over Spock any day. Pointy ears or not. He wasn't the pointy ear guy. All right? Now, so Jesus, God, the Bible says, God loved the world so much what? He sent Jesus. Why? Because the world was in iniquity. The world was bound to sin. God hates sin. And he knew that the end result of those bound to sin was the destiny that the, the, uh, the, the one, the Bible says, that he was perfect until the day that iniquity was found in him. Lucifer, the bright and morning star that fell out of heaven, became the devil, became the devil's above. He found iniquity in him. God hates it. And the destiny of Satan is the lake of fire forever and ever. And God loved the world so much that everybody bound by the sin that bound them to Satan, Jesus came to rid the power of that over mankind and deliver him through Jesus Christ. Amen. He did not come into the world to damn the world. See, Jesus, now remember, he was tempted at every point like we are, yet without sin. That's what the scripture says. 
He was in every point tempted like we are yet without sin. So Jesus could have come in and gone, nana, nana, boo, boo. I did all the law, didn't mess up. You guys did your toast. You're going to burn your toast, your history. Now I came down here and proved to you that you could walk on the earth and not ever miss it, but your toast. No. He came and he looked, see, he looked at God's creation. And God saw his creation was damned to hell. But Jesus didn't come to damn us. I'm not using the word condemn on a purpose. Because people, and I'm not cussing, by the way. Kids probably going, oh my God, he said damn in church. <laughs> Jesus said the word too. And Jesus used the word hell. Ever had your mouth washed out for using the word hell? I don't know why, it's a real place. Hello? You shouldn't be telling people to go there. <laughs> Hello? Now, Jesus did not come to send them there. He came to get them out. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and so Jesus, God looked at this world. We were in a lost state. We were in lawlessness. I mean, we were living in sin, missing the mark, coming up short, making mistakes, transgressing the law. I mean, and then living in lawlessness and rebelling against God. And it's gotten that way again. I mean, so, I mean the, the picture of the other day where the, over in Germany, the homosexuals were uh, using their feces and throwing it on Christians. And then taking the pages of the Bible and ripping that and wiping their back end with it and then throwing that on the Christians. You don't think there's a, that men are living in, in, in an anti-God, an anti-Christ mindset? A lawlessness? I mean, they're just, you know, they're abolishing all law. They have no fear of God. They're lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. We're living in that stage. And gee, God looked down and saw this in the earth. He saw it past, present, and future. And his, see, listen, his hatred for lawlessness put the love of God into action to send his only begotten son who would come and not damn humanity to hell, but provide the deliverance from hell by believing in him and loving what he, God loves and hating what God hates. The love of God does not say, Jeff, I love you and I don't care if you're a thief and a robber. I love you and you get to go to heaven anyway. No, the love of God says, Jeff, I hate iniquity. I hate, and I'm just using you. I hate stealing. I hate robbing. But I'm sending Jesus to break that power over your life. If you'll believe on him, you come out of what I hate and you get separated from what I hate. So when my judgment comes on what I hate, you don't get cooked. That's love. That's love. Love is not, you know, if your kids are, you know, sitting out in the backyard. Uh, my neighbor, our neighbor behind Grady. Grady got Nathan in trouble a couple times. They had a little plastic kid swimming pool, and they buried it in the yard kind of level. And they would put gas and leaves and all kinds of stuff, and then throw it and light it. And, and we came home one day to the backyard, and, and I found later Nathan had been doing the same thing with Grady. Him and Grady had been, been inspiring each other to new heights back in those days, you know. I mean, one neighbor came home one day and said, Nathan, don't you think you ought to come down? He had shibbied about 20 foot up a tree, and he was all like 9 or 10. But Grady, we came in the backyard. Grady's kind of dancing around out there trying to put something out. He had lit the pool on fire near our fence. Well, it was actually their fence. And, and, and you know, he find, when I went over there, he finally got it put out. And I said, Grady, now I love you, son. I said, but that, you know, do you know what could happen to you if that blew up in your face? I said, you'd be ruined. And I had a real strong, I said, no, no I'm not going to tell you, Dad, this time. But I said, don't you ever let it happen again. I love you enough to tell you. And he, he told his dad later. He did tell his dad, and his dad thanked me. He said, you know, that, that put a little whatever in him. kind of shook him up because I, I got on him. But I told him I love him. Yeah. Now, I didn't go over there and say, man, I think y'all, you know, I'll be honest with you, Grady. I think y'all to go get some M80s and throw in there next time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's just take it to another level, man. I mean, light the gas and watch it go, boom, 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 boom. Get four of them there, and you got to stick a dynamite. <laughs> now, you're not supposed to have them in North Carolina anyway, but I mean, I, I had it when I was a kid. Anyway. Yeah, I set one off at the town uh, down at the park one day, and, and, and the cop came around the corner. My brother goes, you idiot, the cop was right there. I ran all the way home with a belly full of collars. I threw them all up. Anyway, <laughs> how do my dad, my dad to this day won't eat collards. Took them up by shoebox. I had a big lunch. 
Now, I love college. Anyway, but think about this. God sees sin. God does not love homosexuality. God loves the lesbian. God loves the homosexual. God loves the, the transgender. God loves uh, the bisexual. He loves you. He hates your sin. He hates your iniquity. And he demands you come out from it and sent Jesus to break its power over you. Why? Because he loves you. And that iniquity will take you to hell. And so he sent Jesus to break that power off of men and off of women. Now, not just that, but all sin. But to break its power off of men. Why? Because he loved them. And he said, he sent his only begotten son because he loved them. Whosoever believed in him would not perish. What does that mean? Mankind is destined to perish. Why would a loving God send anybody to hell? Why would anybody reject a loving God to go to hell? And he sent Jesus, and then it says in the next verse, we, we were quoting, kind of quoting it. I guess if I went over, they would help me quote it correctly. How about that? We always quote John 3, 16. Don't usually get into 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. See, this is, is not damned. See, that's why I said this word <coughs> is not coming there. You know, you made me feel bad. You told me that I couldn't, live as a, I couldn't live as an adulterer. You said that adultery is sinful. And you hurt my feelings. You hate monger. You adulterophobe. You told me that I can't go around and, and, and fornicate. I can't sleep with anybody I want to sleep with, you fornophobe. Let's take the gay out of it. Let's take, let's take the homophobe and all that out of it. Sin. You told me I can't kill people, you murderphobe. Well, that might be accurate. I don't, I don't really want to be around a bunch of murderers. Okay? Listen. He did not come to condemn the world. If you believe on him, you're not damned. But you that believe not are damned. What do you mean? Remember that Jesus came, that whosoever believes in him should not perish. People who are not born again are already destined to damnation and perishing. Amen. So they're already there. Because you believe not on the name. Of, the only way out was not to keep doing what you were doing. It was to believe on Jesus so he could break the power of sin. For this purpose was the Son of God manifest. That he might destroy the works of the devil. One Bible said, one translation says this. To bring to naught the, or reduce to zero the works of the devil. Do you understand that all mankind is already destined to perish? All mankind is already condemned. And the only way to come out of that perishing, come out of that condemnation, or the Greek word damn, being damned, is to what? Believe on him whom God sent so he could break that power. He, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The love of God is to deliver you, not, not avoid hurting your feelings. Jesus said, go tell them to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Didn't say stay the same. He said repent. Now, repentance does carry and contain the idea of going in a different direction, but it's more than that. There is a sorrow, there is a heart that says, I have rebelled against God, and there's a sorrowful, a godly sorrowful, and I got caught, but I have displeased God. Repentance carries that displeasure in it, that you've, you've displeased God. The, the sadness and the whatever uh, that you've reproofed in your heart, you've displeased God. Forgive me. Remember uh, Peter? How many remember Peter? We love Peter. No, Peter is a great guy. He is your biker guy. You know, you know, a biker, oh, rough and gruff, got all the logos and stuff on the back sweater, and they sit down at the bar and cry. And they won't let anybody else see it, but they'll get in the, the biker bar, and they'll all sit around, they'll get about lit up halfway, and they'll start crying and all this kind of stuff. You know, uh, I mean, they, they do the, the, to, the toys things for the kids, and, you know, you start messing with kids, the bikers will show up and hurt you. 
You know, <laughs> they will. I mean, they'll show up and big a whole bunch of them. Just go back. They'll hurt you. You mess with kids. They got old, t- old tender fit, teddy, teddy bear in there. You hiding under all that rough and gruff. Well, Peter was the, the biker day guy of his day. Jesus shows up one day and says, uh, long, you know, preaches a sermon, standing in the Peter's boat because the, shore, the shoreline was so full. He got, launched, got him out in the water a little bit and he preached from the water. When he got there, he said, launch out into the deep for a draw of fish. He goes, now, Lord, now Master, we, we fished all night. I'm an experienced fisherman. You're a preacher. And we caught nothing. In other words, in that area, you didn't catch during the day. And, you know, if it's hot and sunny, you don't catch a lot. Now, my son, he, he, him and Joe went over a couple weeks ago to uh, Oak City Lake Park in Jamestown and went out on the boat, and they were out there. It was 93 degrees. They even got up under the bridge on Penny Road, tied off under the bridge on Penny Road. You know, I brought them lunch. They paddled over, and I gave them lunch, threw it to them. Here's a, here's a subway. Here's a Coke, you know. And here's some more worms. <laughs> they didn't catch a thing. All day. Yeah, they didn't care. It, the line was wet. I mean, as long as, you get your, as long as the twine comes out and it's got water dripping off of it, it's been a good day. And they know it. They know they're not going to catch a thing in that heat. They need to be out there early morning. It needs to be cooler or, you know, whatever. Uh, and and that's, a, that's a cold water. You've got to get out where it's cold, which is out in the center where the, the, the West Fork and the East Fork come together down there. You've got to really get out there. It was too hot to sit out there. It was just too hot. It was hot. And um, so they're out there, and, you know, they're, they're trying to fish. They don't catch anything. So they, but they know that. So um, fishermen know when you go catch fish. They, they know when it's not time to try to catch fish. They know when it is time to catch fish. Peter knew. Master, we fished all night. We didn't catch anything. Besides, you know, what were they doing? They were cleaning the nets. Now, if I go put the nets back in the water, guess what I got to do? I got to clean them again. It's like me coming to my house, and I just got done with our turkey dinner, and we've, we've eaten everything. We've packed it all up and put it all in the refrigerator for the next meal the next day because we're going to have it again because I cook big birds. I didn't say I cook big bird. I cook big birds. All right? We cook 20-pound, 20 22-pound turkeys when we have. I don't care if there's four of us eating. We cook big ones. We make turkey salad. We make turkey hash. I mean, we have turkey dinner again. But, you know, I get it out. Cap, are you happy just thinking about it? Yeah. <laughs> Thanksgiving's on the way. <clears throat> if we find a turkey, we do it before the end. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. What was I going to say? Yep. So you show up at my house. I got all cleaned up, dishes put away, and I and I, my feet are hitting the step because I'm heading that, that 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 stuff with that turkey has hit. Nap time has arrived. <laughs> Pastor Ed's bedroom is calling him. Just like that old uh, beach song, beach music song. You know, summertime's calling me. My my king size bed was a calling me. I forgot if the drifters or the platters or somebody did it. You know, summertime's calling me. Hallelujah. You know, my room darting in shades. Hallelujah. The air conditioning, the fans up there. Right. Whoo, praise God. It's calling me to come bed. And you knock on the door and say, Pastor Ed, I'm sorry I'm late, but I'm hungry. And I look at you like, lunchtime was an hour ago. We've toiled all day. It's all put away. I've cleaned the pots. I've cleaned the pans. I've put all the stuff in the refrigerator. But you know what? <clears throat> Peter said, nevertheless, at that word, we you drag it all back out. You heat it all back up. Peter said, nevertheless, at that word, I let down the net. Now, there's a whole other story there. He didn't let down the nets. He let down the net. Which one? The old scrubby one they hadn't used. Amen? For a draw to fish. Jesus spoke a word. And, you know, and, and, but here's Peter. Peter's going, Peter, Peter's not real spiritual. I mean, think about it. They come to arrest Jesus, he's cutting the guy's ear off. Think about it. Now, he, some of you kind of go, that's my kind of guy. I mean, you know, I mean, that's, that's something I, you know. It's like the guy from um, uh, Blood, Blood Sport with John Van Damme and the other guy, the, the Harley guy, you know, he just kind of, <laughs> Oh, you know, <laughs> hallelujah. That's crazy, you know. Uh, that's Peter. So they come to arrest Peter. He gets out sword and cuts the guy's ear off. And Jesus goes, Peter, go get the ear. Go get the ear. Bring it back over here, Peter. Can I have the ear, please? 
And he puts up against the guy and heals it and puts it back on. Peter's over there going, but I thought I was doing the right thing, boss. I cut his ear off. <laughs> How do you know he don't have it? Because they go to the trial. He's out there and they say, hey, you know him. No, I don't know him. <laughs> yes, you do. I saw you. No, not me. Oh, yeah, yeah. You talk like him. Blankety blank if I do. He started cussing. And then he goes out and weeps bitterly. Amen. Peter was always quick to do stupid stuff. But see, God knew he had the right heart. And he called and he said, when you are, when you, I pray for you, when you're converted, you'll strengthen the brethren. So God saw in Peter a future. And God sees in humanity a future. And he sees that humanity bound by their past, bound by their life, bound by the way they've been brought up, bound by the way they've lived. And he looks into that and said, they can be free, but they cannot be free by their power. I've told them they can't do this, but they do it. I told them they can't live this way, but they live this way. And the reason is they're bound. So what am I going to do? I'll send one who will deliver them from their oppression, who will break the, the bonds of iniquity and set the captives free. And he will come in the likeness of sinful flesh. And he'll live and fulfill the covenant without breaking it. And he'll bear the iniquity and the sin of all humanity. And when I raise him from the dead, I'll set him in my own right hand. My love for humanity is this. They are damned to perish. But I am going to make a means where they don't have to perish. And if they'll just believe, they'll be free. Hallelujah. So God so loved the world that he gave Jesus not to seal them in their state of damnation, but to break the powers of iniquity off of them. So as they believe on him, they'll have everlasting life. What does that mean? He breaks them free of that which he hates. Therefore, you cannot continue in that which he hates and love him. Those who preach, you can keep living in your sin, are violating scripture to love righteousness and abhor iniquity. You're telling people God doesn't care when God cares. Because he knows. See, here, here's, when people begin to remove, remember the word iniquity means lawlessness, and to abolish the law as if it never existed. That's what that word means. Anomia, it ultimately means to abolish, not just law, lawlessness, but to abolish the law as if it never existed. When we start removing the penalty for sin, we've abolished the law. When there is no hell, we've entered into lawlessness. And when we tell people there are no consequences for your actions, we enter into lawlessness. When God knows, God knows, what did he say? He said that people will come to him and he'll say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. What does all this mean? That God knows the end of all those who are in iniquity is to perish. They are damned already. And he loved them so much. He sent Jesus to break that power, and if they'll act on that and believe on him and love righteousness, that means it begins to govern how you live, you have everlasting life. He does not condone continuing in the lifestyle of iniquity. He hated it so much. He gave up his own son to deliver you from it. Let's get this thing right. And stop preaching stupid, feel-good stuff. 
I believe I like feel good stuff. I like the fact that I can be blessed coming in and blessed going out. I like the fact I can be healed in my body. I like the fact that I can have a sound mind. But I also know that in order for people to get there, they're going to have to love righteousness and hate iniquity. You're not going to get those things loving iniquity. You're not going to get those things loving what God hates. Do you know in order for God to love something, there has to be an antithetical that there's something he hates? For there to be good, for us to be able to distinguish good, the antithetical, there has to be evil. Love, hate, good, evil. They're, they're opposed to each other. Why would you want to live in that which is opposed to who God is? Under the guise that he has done something in your life that allows you to. Grace, he put a grace on me, I can live in it. No, 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 no. The grace of God was Jesus coming to deliver you so you could live by the power of that grace the way he wants you to live, free from lawlessness, iniquity, because the penalty for that is where Satan's going. And that's not where he wants you. Can somebody say amen? Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for this word. Thank you for the Holy Ghost giving us wisdom, understanding, enlightenment. Thank you that we love you. We love you. We love you. We love righteousness. We hate iniquity. We abhor iniquity. We love what you love. You love people. We love people. We hate sin. We hate iniquity. We hate lawlessness. We hate transgression. But we love people. So we preach the truth to them. Every head bow, eye closed. If you're here today and Jesus Christ is not the Lord of your life, would you please raise your hand? I want to pray with you. I want to believe God with you. Call you into the kingdom. Hallelujah. Get you out of, get you out of darkness and into the light. Amen. This morning, if you're here, you're backslid. We can pray with you. Get you right with God. Anybody here not baptized in the Holy Ghost? That's real simple. You're born, you're, you're born again. You love Jesus. You got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Speak in other tongues. Just like the, they did on the day of, of Pentecost. You're not baptized in the Holy Ghost. You want to get filled this morning? We'll pray for you. Anybody? We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.